Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Revenue Recognition Implications for Life Sciences and Tech. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar on revenue recognition and how it impacts technology and life sciences companies. As most of you know, calendar year public companies were required to adopt the new ASC 606 standards as of January 1st. Companies spent a lot of time and effort working through the adoption and implementation. We assisted a number of companies through the process, either as their external auditor, their tax advisor, their SOX advisors, or technical accountant consultant. We wanted to share with you some of the lessons that companies and we learned from this process. My name is Richard Krogan, and I will be your moderator today. I am the leader of our life sciences national practice here at Moss Adams, which, uh, which we have the, one of the largest public accounting life science practices outside the big four. Joining me today will be Trevor Gillespie, an insurance partner out of our Silicon Valley office, Dee Mirando Gould, a managing director out of our technical accounting group, and Francisco Sarmiento, a director in our business risk services group. Trevor will start the discussion providing a short overview of AASC 606. There's a lot of information out there on the standard, so we didn't want to spend a lot of time going through over all the technical aspects, but we did want to spend some time um, just reviewing uh, the technical aspects. Dee will then share some of the experiences and lessons learned from public companies that have gone through the analysis and the adoption of the standards. Francisco will add some thoughts on how companies incorporate the new rules into their internal controls, and I will add a few comments on some tax considerations. Then I'll turn it back over to Dee and Trevor, who will talk about things to consider when implementing the standards. But before we get into the good stuff, we have a few polling questions to make sure that we know our audience. Um, remember, to receive CPE credits, you will need to complete three out of four polling questions. And we're going to start off with two softball questions, uh, again, just to kind of understand our audience. Uh, the first one is, what type of company do you work for? Um, are you a public company? Do you work for a public company, a private company? 
Are you a consultant of some sort? Uh, do you work in public accounting or something else? Uh, this will help us just to make sure um, we know who's on the line. There is a large number of people that were uh, signed up, um, so we want to make sure we target our comments appropriately. I presume that there will be a lot of private company people on, but we'll see what the uh, responses are. I think I'm supposed to allow 45 seconds to get everyone to answer, so don't hesitate. I'm going to wrap this up as soon as possible so we can get on to all the good stuff we have on uh, plan for this morning. All right. I think I'm going to wrap it up here, give everyone about five more seconds, and all right, we'll... We'll go. So as as we thought, it seems like most of the people are from um, work with a private company. So um, as expected. So I, I think we're right on target there. Um, so thanks for uh, uh, completing that. And so our second polling question. Again, we're going to hit two right off the bat, so we have fewer to do later in um, in the process. Um, I wanted to see how far along are you in preparing to implement uh, ASC 606? Are you just starting to think about it? Um, or you actually have have you started the planning? Uh, have, you, have you started the planning and, and are beginning to analyze um, um, how it may impact the company? Or are you already uh, deep into the middle of the analysis? Or are you done? And I expect there'll be few that are done, but if you are, that that would be fantastic. Uh, so uh, again, we're just trying to to make sure that we frame and, and, and modify our presentation um, on the fly. Uh, if, if everybody's done, that, <laughs> then uh, I, I don't know what we'll talk about, but I'm sure we'll share some stories. Uh, all right, again, everyone submit. We want everyone to get the CPE. Give everyone about five more seconds. Wrap that up, and yep, yeah, as 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 I thought that um, most people are just starting to think about it, or and and some are, are have started, but maybe have aren't too far along. There are some that are are done, so that that's good to hear, and hopefully you'll um, benefit from some of the discussions on, on the lessons learned. Um, with that, I'm going to now turn it over to Trevor, who will start off with a brief overview of the 606 standards. Thanks, Rich. And let me just start off with a couple of overview thoughts. Before we jump into the meat of today's webcast, we want to do a refresh of the revenue standard just to ensure we're setting the right framework and foundation for the remainder of today's discussion. So with that foundation setting goal in mind, I think it's important to first understand what the overarching principle of the revenue standard is, and that is that a company should recognize revenue when it transfers goods or services to a customer and the amount of revenue recognized should represent the consideration that that company expects to be entitled to. This transfer concept really varies from legacy revenue gap, which is more about when a company transfers the risk of loss to a customer. Um, so it's a little bit of a paradigm shift. I, I also want to highlight and underscore that the revenue standard is principles-based versus being overly prescriptive, so there aren't bright lines. And as a result, the amount of judgment in applying the standard is higher. Uh, in applying the standards personally, I've found that spending time in the background and basis for conclusions has been helpful to me in understanding how to understand and apply the standard as the rulemaking body really tended to show their intentions in those basis for conclusions. So I would encourage everyone to consider utilizing that in your own uh, implementation of the standard and definitely don't forget that FASB has issued five or six additional ASUs that help clarify on certain implementation issues. All right, continuing with our reminder, as I think we hopefully all know at this point, the standard has five basic criteria which are listed here, and I'm going to get into step one right now. Okay, so step one sounds relatively simple when you say identify the contract with the customer, 
but there are some key things that you want to be aware of that make this just a little bit more intricate than it might appear at a surface level. Customer has its own definition, and if you don't have a customer um, as defined in the standard, you might not be in topic 606 at all. As you can see on this slide, there are also five sub-criteria to step one that have to be met uh, to support that you have a contract with a customer before you can even move to steps two through five. And if you fail to meet any one of those criteria, you'll have to defer any proceeds received on the arrangement until all of those criteria are met. There are no remaining obligations under the contract or in a less uh, common scenario, the contract is terminated and any fees paid uh, are deemed to be non-refundable. That deferral could be an unintended consequence. So as you pre prepare for an implementation strategy, I think it's really important to make sure you spend enough time in this first step of 606 as there's really a lot under the hood of what really appears to be relatively straightforward. Before we move on, I just remember the term contract also is a broad term. Some companies don't utilize official contracts, so when you're thinking about um, identifying a contract with a customer in step one, think of contract being more broad as an, an agreement between two or more related parties that creates enforceable rights. Okay, moving on to step two, which is identifying the performance obligations. Basically, performance obligations under the standard are promises made in the contract, and they're separate promises. The main point I want to make with this slide, and it really relates to companies that have multiple promises in their contract, is whether or not you can unbundle those promises or do those promises need to be aggregated together. To be considered a separate performance obligation, a promise has to be both capable of being distinct, meaning it has standalone value to the customer, and it needs to be distinct within the context of the contract. All right, step three, determining the transaction price. This one will be relatively straightforward for some contracts and quite complex for others. The transaction price as defined in the standard is the amount of consideration that a company expects in exchange for delivering the goods or services to a customer. And in situations where you're providing discounts, rights of return, variability in the amount of consideration based on contractual terms or, or even a significant financing component due to extended payment terms, the transaction price itself will need to be adjusted. So companies with contracts that have these types of provisions are really going to have to critically evaluate those provisions and the impact they're going to have on the amount of transaction price in the arrangement, which then gets ascribed to the various performance obligations. And that takes us into step four, allocating the transaction price. Allocation of the transaction price shouldn't be too difficult once a company's identified all of its separate promises that are considered performance obligations under 606 and then determined the transaction price after taking into consideration the items that we just brought up in step three. After that, the next step is then to allocate that transaction price amount to the various performance obligations utilizing a relative selling price method. And standalone here is really the key word. And for companies that don't sell certain products or services on a standalone basis, but have performance obligations that have to have a portion of transaction price allocated to them are really going to have to apply judgment and make some estimates in determining what the standalone selling price for that unsold uh, item may be. And to do that, companies can utilize a couple of approaches. You could use a top-down approach or a, a bottom-up approach, which is essentially a, almost a cost-plus type of approach. Then once the standalone selling price is determined for all of the separate performance obligations in the contract, for those familiar with the allocation model in ASC 60525, the allocation in topic 606 is essentially the same, where you're adding up the total uh, standalone selling prices of all of those uh, performance obligations, and then generally, and I, I really want to underscore here generally because it's not 100% of the time, generally allocate any discount in the contract uh, 
proportionally to the performance obligation such that when you sum up all of those allocated values, it adds up to the transaction price that you determined in step three. After you're done with your allocation, the next step is to recognize revenue as those performance obligations are satisfied. The key thing here to remember is that some performance obligations are satisfied at a point in time, while other performance obligations are satisfied over time, so the recognition of revenue is generally going to have to follow that same pattern of satisfaction. A couple of bullet points I have listed here on the slide is that the sell-through model that has been a component of revenue when you sell through distributors is essentially eliminated. Instead, a company is going to have to assess in the context of the contract, is the distributor the customer? And then for any return rights that a distributor may have, those have to be accounted for in adjusting the transaction price in step three. Um, so that's a fundamental shift in terms of when you've historically done a sell-through model of potentially reducing your transaction price and then recognizing revenue upon shipment to the distributor, assuming that all of their recognition criteria are met and that that distributor is the customer. All right, I'm running out of my allocated time, but I really want to make sure that I hit on contract costs because accounting for contract costs is another key change. The revenue standard requires that incremental costs to obtain a contract get deferred as a, a contract asset and recognized over the contract, except there's a practical expedient that 606 allows those contract costs to be expensed if the contract period is less than one year. So assuming a company has incremental costs and the contract extends beyond a year, it's really important to note that deferring that cost as a contract asset on the balance sheet is not a policy election under 606, but it's a requirement. Most of what we're expecting to be qualifying as an incremental cost for many companies is going to be sales commissions. Um, but I also want to highlight that, that some companies may assess that certain legal fees for preparing and reviewing a customer contract feel incremental, but the standard is pretty specifically specific that those costs are not considered contract costs uh, under the revenue standard, so those don't qualify as something that you would defer. Finally, the costs uh, to fulfill a contract, if they aren't covered by another standard, are capitalized if they relate to the contract and the future performance of the contract. And in this case, think about certain design costs that a company incurs to fulfill a contract, which will be deferred in under 606, contrasting that against costs of things like wasted materials and labor, which are expensed. Okay, so that was a brief overview refresher. Again, just to set the framework and foundation for the rest of this uh, discussion, we're going to jump into one more polling question before we get into the meat of our presentation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Rich. Thanks, Trevor. That was great. Um, so um, now, so, so polling question number three, don't forget to answer. Have you been following what public companies have been doing? Have you been pulling up their 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 Qs or their their Ks and and looking at their disclosure and MD&A discussion? Um, uh, have you been listening in on webinars or reading articles? Um, Want to see how actively people have been following um, uh, discussion um, of of the adoption and implementation of the standards? So pretty simple, yes, no, and somewhere in the middle, somewhat. Um, so again, we, it's a pretty straightforward question. Hope we want everyone to answer. Um, so we'll give everyone uh, about a total of 30 seconds, and we're probably about halfway through that. Um, uh, again, I'd like to remind um, all participants that if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to use the Q&A tab. Um, we will be monitoring it. I did just click on it. I see a number of questions coming in already. So well, we'll either try to get to them um, during the next, uh, during the various breaks at the end, or uh, via direct um, answer, um, and then afterwards we'll we'll provide uh, provide all the uh, questions and answers to to all participants. Um, 
All right, so wrapping up the polling question. So um, there's about 70% of you that have been following it. So um, that probably ties in pretty closely with the public company audience. Um, and then the rest is kind of split. People have, have not followed it for, for whatever reason. They have a full-time job already. Um, and no need to get ahead of themselves. But um, anyway, that's kind of, I guess, what we expected. Um, so that's good to hear. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dee, who's going to talk through some of the lessons learned from the public company adoption. Thank you, Rich. So I'm going to jump right into lessons learned here um, from my various assessment and implementation projects with public and actually private companies on 606. The top point here is don't delay. You may think that you have a lot of time, so if you're a calendar year company and you have to adopt in 2019, but you don't have to issue your annual financial statements until sometime in 2020, you know, maybe March, April, May 2020, that sounds like a couple of years of time still to get through this, but from public company experience, this takes longer than people expected it to take even if your revenue doesn't change significantly. Uh, the amount of time it takes depends on the complexity and the diversity of contracts you have, even the volume of contracts you might have to look at. You also have to document your judgments and your conclusions. So even if you don't have a change, your auditors are going to expect to see the documentation and the analysis around the implementation of the new standard. You have to prove, essentially, that revenue doesn't change. So thinking about it, when you say something's immaterial, your auditors are always going to ask you, well, how do you know it's immaterial, unless you've done something around that. Same kind of thing here. You really have to document why something's happening a certain way. And then the cost to acquire a contract may very well change, even if the revenue doesn't. So typically in life science and technology companies, you pay sales commissions. And it's not just sales commissions. You know, Trevor touched on the cost to acquire a contract. But if you're paying bonuses to executives and those bonuses are based just on revenue, those are cost to acquire a contract, even though they're not tied directly to a particular contract. The, the transition uh, resource group of the revenue project was very clear. Bonuses, stock-based compensation, performance-based stock-based compensation awards, that key off of revenue are going to be cost to acquire a contract, and it doesn't really matter if they're just salespeople or what the title of the people are. It's still cost to acquire a contract. So that's something that for people to be thinking about. Don't leave your financial statement disclosures to last. And this is something that I think a lot of public companies really struggled with because the assessment and the implementation may have taken a long time and then all of a sudden they're looking at the disclosures and the disclosures are significant. So even if revenue doesn't change for you, your disclosures are likely, very likely to change. Disaggregated revenue, you have to um, disaggregate by, you know, maybe by customer, maybe by contract type, maybe by geographic, maybe by product. So there's a wide variety of di potential disaggregation. Contract balances, contract assets, contract liabilities, receivables, you have to do a roll forward of those. You have to document significant judgments. Talk about your performance obligations and, you know, when those performance obligations are satisfied, you know, significant payment terms, obligations for returns, refunds, you know, types of warranties, all of those things have to be disclosed. You also have to talk about your accounting policies, and there are new accounting policies that are going to come through with this standard. And you have to talk about the effective date and the transition, the actual impact on your financial statements showing the line items that are changing because of the adoption of this standard. Technology may also provide limited assistance in actually doing your contract reviews. So although you may be getting your data from your technology, there may be unique terms and conditions and complexity in your arrangements that make it difficult to pull that information out through technology. You may not capture that information in the technology. So you might want to think about, you know, sales incentives, you know, if there's termination clauses in a contract. You may 
you know, include in your system the start date and the end date of a contract. But you may not be capturing the fact that there are termination clauses um, in a contract, and that's going to have an effect on your contract, per repurchase options and, you know, the other things I've listed here. The assessment under this uh, new standard is different than under existing GAAP. And Trevor mentioned this briefly in his introduction, but essentially you have to understand what you're providing to customers in order to apply the new standard. So the old standard looked at a risk and rewards model. This looks at a control model, but it also looks at what you're providing the customer. So thinking about, you know, a performance obligation, what's what's distinct and what's distinct within the context of the contract. All of that is new um, information in this standard. So it does, um, that is one challenge I saw with some of my clients. Accounting may have thought that it understood what the company was actually providing to customers, but when they actually started talking to operations, that view changed because they got more information around the, the products that were being sold or the services that were being provided. So the effort involves more than accounting personnel, as I alluded to a minute ago. So sure, accounting is going to evaluate the contracts under the five-step model that Trevor talked about, document, your, you know, document the conclusions, you know, determine, calculate the impacts, draft the disclosures, sure, all of that. But you might want to think about um, having contracts and legal involved. So do you want to revise any contract terms? For example, if there are termination clauses, you could have to go to um, assessing the contract on a month-to-month -month basis because it, be, it can be terminated at will. Okay? Um, that may not be something you really intended with the contract you know, um, customer rights to payment. So be thinking about all of those things, and that's a discussion to have. Operations, you may need to talk to operations about what is being sold, as I alluded to. Human resources and employee benefits, talking about the cost to acquire a contract, um, sales commissions, bonus plans, stock-based compensation. You may not be changing these, but at least you want to think about the impacts of those and think about whether or not you do want to have any updates there and let your, you know, your HR know that process. Information technology. You want your IT people to be thinking, helping you with any data gaps and whether or not there, a change in technology is actually needed. The good thing for private companies is that there's probably a lot more um, software out there now than there was when in 2014 or 2015 um, as the standard first came out and started, you know, people started looking at it. So um, the other thing to think about is the budgeting. If there is an impact, you want to think about how that's going to impact your budgeting. Uh, it may be a change to revenue, but then again, it may be a change to costs, and that all could impact your budgeting. Income taxes, I know that Rich is going to talk more about income taxes later, but you want to get your tax people involved early in the discussion because there are going to be change, there are going to be potential changes, and some of these are going to have a change for tax purposes as well. Um, so you want to be considering those implications early. Internal controls, so Francisco is going to talk about internal controls, but you want to assess the risks and evaluate the impact on controls as you go through this process. You may think your existing controls might work, but there are different judgments, there's different assessments now that you have to think about. Governance, you wanna talk about, you know, you wanna make sure you're communicating with your stakeholders, the people that use your financial statements. So be thinking about, you know, who needs to understand what might be happening and have those com discussions, those communications as you're going through this process. This assessment and implementation may take outside support, and this may be somewhat obvious. So most companies don't have access employees just sitting around waiting for special projects to pop up. Employees have their day jobs. And so this is a big addition to the process when you um, have to add this standard. So they may not have the time, employees may not have the time, and then they may not have the expertise. Really what I learned about this standard is 
you don't really know what you don't know until you start working through things. Um, it's, it's a real eye-opener. So training, just learning online is, you know, um, is helpful, but really digging into it is going to be really, really important. You may also want to think about a dedicated project manager, especially if you have a big project, because this takes um, time. Um, and so I want to make sure that, that, um, that you understand that keeping the project on task is important so that you don't fall behind. Okay, and last couple of points here. Educate your employees. You're going to need to um, turn this over to your employees on an ongoing basis. Sure, you might use some outside help and you might have the initial assessment and the implementation, but you need to make sure that your employees are going to be able to carry this forward. So you want to make sure you educate and train your, your employees as to how things are affecting your company under this standard. And then coordinate with your, your auditors early. The earlier you do that, the better off you're going to be. I think public companies had a little bit of a challenge with this because their auditors were still learning. But now um, the auditors are already up to speed to some extent on the standard. And that's a good thing, and that's going to help. And so they'll talk to you. And this helps you avoid rework. And now I'm going to turn this over to Rich. Thanks, Dee. Um, so we've already had a number of questions come in, so that, that's great. Keep them coming. I don't know that we'll get to all of them, but we'll, uh, we'll highlight a few of them um, and, and then respond to the group. Um, so Dee, we'll start off with one to you. It's, a, it's the most recent one that I saw that comp came in. Um, I know you just got done. Um, but um, what about a small company undergoing their first, their first audit and adopting from the start? Any pointers? Anything to specially consider there? Um, that's a that's a good question. If you're going through your first audit, you know, pull your auditor in um, really quickly in the process. And I think since you're going through your first audit, I think your auditors will be very happy to have that collaborative discussion. So when you're going through, we'll talk about implementation, but when you're going through the scoping um, and talking about you know, portfolios that we'll talk more about later. I think bringing your auditors in really early is a really important process um, so that you don't do more work than you need to. You just do enough to get your auditors comfortable. Thanks, Dee. Uh, another question that came in, um, what if bonuses are tied to EBITDA? Would that flag the requirement to recognize over the life of the contract? Trevor, what are your thoughts? So I think when you look to the, the, the term of incremental costs to obtain a contract, if you have EBITDA-based bonuses that have already been um, kind of um, agreed to with your employee base, those would not be qualified uh, most likely given the fact that they're not incremental costs to obtaining a contract. They're, they're ultimately tied to a different financial metric. So you wouldn't have to evaluate those uh, necessarily those EBITDA-based bonuses for deferring as a contract asset. You know, Rich, I'll just add something to that, and I agree completely with Trevor. This is Dee again. Um, that is one way some companies have been able to get out of um, – uh, adding bonuses, for example, to cost to acquire a contract, if they tie those bonuses to something more subjective, um, so to, um, to multiple criteria, it could be revenue, but it could be other soft performance-based, and if you don't put certain percentages on it, that can pull you out of having those costs specifically tied to a contract. Excellent. Thanks. Um, I'll do one more here, and this one's somewhat um, interesting, and I'm interested in, in knowing. What if the contract is exactly one year? Do these rules apply? I'll, I'll jump in and answer that. I think if you've got a contract that is exactly one year, I think the question is probably stemming around, do you capitalize or expense um, those contract costs that are considered incremental. Well, one, you can adopt the practical expedient that allows you to expense those, or if they're direct and incremental, you can apply 606 and defer those and amortize those over a one-year period. So you've probably got an option there. There is no absolute requirement to expense uh, incremental costs under the 606. If you have incremental costs, 
and they are extending over a contract that is more than one year, you have a requirement to defer those in as, as an asset. But if they are 12 months or less, you can adopt that practical expedient to expense them. Thanks, Trevor. All right, now we're going to um, continue on with the rest uh, of the presentation. Continue to use that Q&A, and at the end, we'll, we'll uh, try to address some more questions, or as I mentioned, we'll uh, write them up and, and send them out to the group. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Fran Francisco to talk about um, internal controls. Francisco. Yep. Thank you, Rich. Um, so we'll now move on to the internal con control considerations of our presentation. Uh, as Dee mentioned earlier, one of the areas that management should pay attention to as part of the 606 adoption process are internal controls. It is quite important for us to take a look at those areas as well because there are specific considerations and cir circumstances that can increase the risk of material misstatement with any new standards adoption. You know, given that revenue is generally assessed as automatically as a high-risk account as part of the audit, the adoption of new revenue standards and the considerations around it makes it a major focus during the audit. And this emphasizes the need to have effective internal controls during the entire adoption process. So when we're establishing internal controls for the 606 adoption, management would need to identify the key stages of the adoption process. The first is the accounting policy revision. Second of the stage is the revenue stream scoping and identification. Third is the contract selection and review. And finally, the calculation and disclosure of transition adjustments. It is important that management evaluate the risk of financial or disclosure misstatement at each stage of this adoption process, as this would allow management to identify the appropriate internal controls to put into place. So the identification of controls during this adoption process is not different for any control assessment process in place. You start with identifying the risk relevant to the company in this situation, what's the risk related to the 606 adoption, 606 adoption related to the company, and then identifying what are the risks related uh, and controls that could address those risks. So for the accounting policy revision, there is always the risk that the company's policies and procedures may have not been updated to reflect the new standards or that the policy that management creates does not reflect the actual contract terms and conditions. In terms of revenue scoping and identification, the risk would depend on the company's approach as the scoping risk is different between the modified retrospective or the full retrospective approach. So management will have to tailor what is their approach and what's the risk related to that approach. It will be affected uh, by the approach for reviewing the contract as well, which can be done fully or through a sampling method. The biggest risk here is not having a complete population of the contracts or assigning a wrong contract to the wrong revenue stream or unique contracts that may fall out during the scoping process. Management will need to ensure that all types of contracts have been considered in the scoping and each of the contract scenario have been considered as well. This is an area where management can trip up and therefore appropriate internal knowledge or outside help will be needed. As Dee mentioned, there are a lot of players involved in this process, so it's really important for us to make sure that when we're uh, doing this stage of the process, we involve all of the players to know what are the, all the risks that can be up. Uh, applicable during this adoption process. Finally, in terms of calculation and disclosures, there's always the risk of error in the calculation and disclosure, and thus it is important for management to have adequate sa safeguard for this risk by ensuring that all of the calculation and the related disclosures are prepared by a competent person or a third-party service provider, and that the reviewer have appropriate procedures in place to test the calculation and disclosures for accuracy and that the reviewer have adequate technical knowledge to challenge the calculation and disclosures to provide, provide meaning, uh, meaningful review. I think the, the biggest uh, risk here is management relying entirely on a third party or another person to do the calculation. So with any internal controls, the responsibility 
lies with management. So somebody in management needs to have that adequate knowledge to provide a meaningful review of all the calculation and disclosures, even though we hire a third party to, to help us with this adoption process. So once all the risks related to the 606 adoption stages are identified, management will then need to ensure that appropriate internal controls are in place to mitigate those risks to prevent or detect financial misstatements. When establishing internal controls, there are several key considerations that we will need to address. Management should also need to ensure that appropriate combination of entity level, transaction, and monitoring controls activities are in place during the adoption process. For entity level controls, Management will need to ensure that the accounting policies were reviewed to verify compliance with the new standards and that the team involved in the adoption, either employees, contractors, or third-party service providers can competently perform their duties. As the success of the, or failure of any adoption depends on the quality of the team, it is important that management get this right from the get-go. With regards to the actual review of the contracts, Management must first have a process to ensure that all revenue streams have been considered and that all the contracts that need to be reviewed are included in the scope. If management will be using the sampling approach, it must also ensure that it covers all of the revenue streams and that the contracts selected are representative of both the population and revenue stream. This area can be tricky, and thus management may require help from a third-party service provider to ensure that all of the various contracts and scenarios have been considered in the scoping and the sampling. In our experience, this to be a, an area where proved to be its most challenging and time consuming for management because uh, ensuring the completeness and accuracy of the contract information takes a bit of time. Either it's due to the lack of central contract database where you can get all of your contract in one, contracts in one place or there's a lack of tracking mechanism for uh, modifications to the contract. So you may have a contract in a contract database, but if there's no way for you to track changes in that uh, contract during the, those years, then it will, be, it will prove difficult for us to make sure that all the contracts that we will be evaluating uh, is accurate. So with regard to the calculation and the disclosures, management should also ensure that the transition adjustments are accurately calculated and that complete disclosures will be made. As you may see, some of the rest may only be present during the adoption period, and therefore the related controls require only one-time operation. Therefore, management will only have one chance to make sure that the controls are working effectively the first time they're done. And that's why we're emphasizing the need to make sure that all the controls have been established and designed appropriately at the first time it's, it's done. In our experience, management at times focuses too much on the end goal and forgets that it's important to have internal controls at each step of the process to ensure that things are done correctly and in accordance to the standard. Also, management will need to consider evaluating the overall control environment immediately after the transition, as we expect that there might be some changes in the process uh, with the new uh, revenue standards. Uh, adequate internal controls have to be designed on those new processes as well, and management will need to make sure that it's considered as well moving forward. And with that, um, I'll turn our presentation to, um, to Rich, who will cover the uh, tax considerations. Thanks, Francisco. Um, as I mentioned earlier, and as, as Dean also mentioned, I want to remind our listeners to not forget about the tax implications. Um, the tax team and tax advisors will need to understand the details of the uh, 606 analysis and calculations. Uh, first, and quite simply, your deferred, ac your deferred tax assets will likely change. As your deferred revenue changes, um, that ties directly generally directly to your deferred tax assets. Um, also, one of the main points of, of 606 is the transaction price. Um, you know, this includes stuff like discounts, potential returns, variable revenue, and other contract costs. Um, they also include expenses. Um, and, and, and these, and these re points of revenues and, and expenses are frequently treated differently 
for tax purposes. So we would need to know all the various components um, and, and how they go into um, deferred revenue or revenue recognition. Um, you know, uh, generally the IRS only allows for expenses that are actually paid out within a short t period of time, um, but you can also generally ex expense rather than capitalize expenses. Um, so it can go either either way. Um, um, in addition, um, to make it more challenging, um, uh, the, the recent change in the tax law also uh, will impact uh, the tax considerations. Um, uh, and part of it is is reactive, and part of it is um, and by reactive, um, the, the change in the uh, NOL carry forward period. Uh, for, for federal purposes, it's now indefinite. So companies might think differently about um, you know, pushing um, expenses out of 17 and into 18. Um, and, and there are ways to, to kind of plan around that. Um, and also uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act also um, changed the revenue recognition rules of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, Section 451 now requires um, income is recognized for tax purposes at the earlier when the all events test is satisfied or when the amount is recognized in the taxpayer's financial statements. So um, we'll need to, uh, the tax team would need to analyze um, both those tests um, to determine when it's included in, in, in taxable income. Um, also, I um, want to talk a bit about tax return reporting. Um, first and um, foremost, you know, company should be modeling out their current and future taxes. Is there a possibility to get the kind of a permanent tax benefit by, um, you know, a, 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 you know front-loading costs or, or deferring revenue into 2017 um, and, and out of 18 when uh, 18 has a reduced tax rate? So generally, we advise companies to to max to minimize their income in 17. Um, when, when there's a higher tax rate. Um, uh, and, and generally, companies would need to look at their tax accounting methods, um, so they should be, um, and there's ways to change that, but, it, but because um, you, you're changing from, you know, you could change your tax accounting method of 17, but your, um, your gap methods may change for, for, for 2019, you gotta figure out how, how it would look in 2017, 2018, and 2019. So you need to consider um, multiple years and the implication, um, the tax implication on those years. Um, and the IRS just released some new guidance um, this week um, on some automatic tax accounting method changes to assist taxpayers. Um, so this is very timely to, to think through. Um, some other considerations, uh, they're a, a bit, bit removed, but because the revenue is going to be changing on, on, on tax returns, um, your state apportionment might change. So your state effective tax rate could change for your financial statements. So you've got to kind of think through that and how apportionment may change. Um, sales and use tax, um, that's generally based upon when cash is paid and or received. Um, but you, get, you should be thinking through how that may, may factor in to the overall um, um, revenue recognition principles, but also how it may impact your, your sales and use tax reporting process. Uh, same with foreign withholding and VAT. Um, generally, those are based upon when cash are paid, but you need to kind of think through those processes um, a, a, as you're implementing your new, new controls and new processes. Um, the, the, I just wanted to throw out a list of potential tax differences, um, you know, license and maintenance payments, you know, when are they paid, when are they received. Um, there, there could be some differences on, on maintenance um, in, in particular, um, but it, again, it's very fact-specific. Fact uh, contingent consideration, whether it's a bonus or a penalty, um, the, the tax rules can apply uh, differently, so uh, be cautious of that. Uh, future royalties, um, you know, if those are being factored into your revenue recognition um, but haven't been earned from a tax perspective, there may be a, a chance to defer uh, some of that income. Uh, contract cost, um, you know, it depends upon whether you're, you're 
um, accruing for, for future cost or for, for uh, or capitalizing prior cost, um, those may be treated differently. Um, and then the right of return and discounts and, uh, and some of those items are, are often not um, allowed as a reduction of revenue from a tax perspective. So things to consider, um, very fact dependent. The bottom line is just the tax team would need to know the, the detail of, of, of your revenue um, recognition analysis. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to back over to Trevor and to Dee's talk a bit uh, on implement, implementation. Thanks, Rich. And I'll just uh, want to cover a couple of the the practical expedients. You can see on this slide, there's a few of them. We covered the practical expedient with respect to contract costs. If you have uh, contracts that are 12 months or less, you can apply a practical expedient to expense any contract costs. Um, in general, just kind of coming up to the first bullet point, um, 606 looks at you know applying the, these five steps to individual contracts, but there is a, a practical expedient that allows you to use a portfolio approach. If you have a population of contracts that have similar characteristics, um, you can group those together and, and look at those from a portfolio type of approach as a practical expedient. Uh, most practical expedients, if you adopt and apply them, you do need to disclose that you've uh, applied a practical expedient in your financial statement footnotes. A good practical expedient with respect to uh, 606 is the immaterial promises in the context of the contract don't need to be assessed as to whether or not they are a separate performance obligation. So there is some judgment with respect to is this promise in the contract immaterial and is it immaterial in the context of the contract? Uh, to the extent that those answers are yes, then you wouldn't need to evaluate for assessing that as a separate standalone performance obligation. Um, and then there are some practical expedients with respect to the adoption of 606, the very first date of adoption with respect to in-process contracts on the date of adoption. The, the point here is really making sure that you're aware of there are the, the general rules in 606, and then there are practical expedients that can be um, helpful in adopting and implementing and then on an ongoing basis applying topic 606. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dee uh, to talk about implementation strategy. Thanks, Trevor. So I'm going to make this, um, try to keep this short because we have another polling question and I know we have some questions we want to try to get to. So we've done this in phases, you know, the initial assessment. So some of these are pretty obvious. I think in phase one, where I want to focus mostly is um, thinking about the scoping, thinking about your um, looking at your revenue streams, understanding your, you know, your contracts, and putting them into, as Trevor talked about, into portfolios with consistent terms. So looking at a portfolio that has you know, the same revenue stream, the same, time, the same contract terms, so that you can look at um, a minimal number of contracts in that portfolio and then say, okay, my conclusions apply to everything else. Obviously, when you do that, you have to pull out the things that have non-standard um, contract terms. But some non-standard contract terms might not have much of an implication. So, for example, if your standard terms say, you know, you, um, your payment is net 30 and you change that for a customer to net 45 or net 60, that in and of itself wouldn't have an impact for the standard, especially if it doesn't change your assessment as to the collectability being probable under the contract. But you have to still identify those. And then, you know, making sure that um, – that with that scoping, you've talked to your um, your auditors. They agree with those portfolios and what you're looking at in those portfolios as far as the number of contracts to look at. Um, you know, and then you need to pull your your resources and think about the controls as we've already talked about. You know, you document your controls, and then in in phase three is where you really perform the contract assessment. So I typically do this with a um, with looking at the 
the um, an initial assessment, so maybe picking one or two contracts from each of those portfolios for standard terms, maybe looking at the non-standard term one separately, and then talking with the auditors. Um, it's likely you'd have to do an expanded contract analysis. How many contracts in that expanded analysis um, really is going to depend on, you know, how many contracts you have and what your auditors are going to be comfortable with and how standard your terms are. Um, and then you want to document your rationale. This talks about documenting um, your work in a technical accounting memo. Those memos can get really long. I've written memos that have gone up to 80 pages for a 606 assessment, and that is really long for someone to read. I actually prefer, if you're doing contract analysis, that you actually look at the um, contracts, um, do a, a checklist or questionnaire for a particular contract, document all your conclusions around the five-step model and the calculation of what might change, and then you can do a summary memo that's nice and short that pulls everything together for all of your portfolios. And that's where I'd be thinking about. And I'm going to turn this over to Rich for the um, polling question. Thanks, Steve. All right. So this is the fourth polling question. We need everyone to respond, uh, or you need to respond if you want CPE credit. Um, and when do you think your company will be ready? Do you think you'll um, be ready in, in Q3 of this year? Maybe, maybe start testing or maybe um, working with your, your auditors, having them re pre-review it. Um, do you think it will be later in the year, in Q4 sometime? Um, do you think it will be um, roll into next year that you get your hands full of just wrapping up this year and you'll get at it when preparing for the audit next year? Um, or uh, Q2 uh, of 19, um, as many of you are, are private companies and, and often that's when, when the audits for those happen, or will it be sometime later? Um, I'm just kind of curious, just kind of lay out the time frame of, of for you to what to expect and, and when you'll be um, hitting it. Okay. All right. So give everyone a few more seconds to um, answer the question. All right. And it looks like it, it's fairly uh, fairly spread out. So uh, with a with most people, um, you know, and, and private companies, um, I, I guess this is, um, this is, yeah, I guess what I would expect. Um, so with that, I want to um, go back to a, a couple of the questions, um, and um, some of them are pretty technical, and it's, it's hard to really answer those or, or address those um, on the fly here. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to pick out some of the general ones that might have some broader applicability. Um, so Trevor, a question came in. Um, um, is milestone revenue recognition still allowed? Well, it's a good question, and I, I would say, you know, from a standpoint of, of, you know, what's in current revenue gap today, that will be superseded by Topic 606. So, as a company applies the revenue standard, it's really, you know, important to evaluate, you know, first, you know, your, your step one, and your step two is identifying the performance obligations in the contract. And part of your performance obligations is assessing those performance obligations that are um, satisfied at a point in time and those that are satisfied over time. And you know, to the extent that you get into a single performance obligation model and that performance obligation is satisfied over time, then what today is recognized potentially under milestone accounting it may approximate the same thing under 606, but it, it really should take a, a different look and feel. Company really should be evaluating, you know, how that performance obligation is satisfied over time and taking into consideration the constraints on transaction price and all the other components of 606. So it's a little bit of a loaded question, but in general, the milestone standard that's in 606 or 605 right now will be superseded by 606, but there could be instances where you recognize similarly to how you're recognizing under a milestone method today. Okay. Thanks, Trevor. Um, all right. So 
before we, we sign off here, it's, it's 10.59, um, and so our hour's up. Um, here's a bunch of resources if you're interested in, in, in more. Um, the, the first few um, are, are links to our, our website um, where we have general information, including rest and revenue recognition information for both our technology practices and our life science practices. Um, we have some strategies for companies to stay ahead of the guidelines, and so those um, that information may be helpful. Uh, uh, and then um, the, we also have a specific insight on the effects of 606 on your contracts with customers. So don't hesitate to pull those resources down and look at those. Um, and also, um, don't hesitate to reach out to, to any of us. Um, we, we've enjoyed doing this. We do enjoy talking with our clients about this. Um, hopefully you've gained some insight. Um, and with that, we're, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining. Um, and Emily, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you, Rich, Trevor, Dee, and Francisco for a great presentation today. Uh, we certainly covered a lot of material. And as Rich mentioned, uh, if you have questions for our speakers, uh, feel free to reach out to them directly um, in the Q&A Submission will be open for a few more moments if you'd like to submit there, and we'll be happy to follow up after the webcast. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts icon to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. The copy will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you'll join us again next time. <laughs>